Sukendu Shekhar Roy. You have seven minutes. You can go up to ten minutes, please. Thank you, sir. Sir, when we discuss on the working of the or the functioning of the Ministry of Law and Justice, first of all, I would like to highlight about the three departments. The three departments which are functioning under the Ministry of Law and Justice. And all of us know that these are Department of Legal Affairs, Legislative Department and Department of Justice. So far the Department of Legal Affairs is concerned. They are dealing with 13 items or 13 major areas. They are functioning related to 13 major areas. I don't want to go into details because of the paucity of time and the instructions given by you, sir. Similarly, legislative department, they are also acting as a, mainly as a service provider because they are having the scrutiny of notes for cabinet, drafting of government bills, etc., etc. And the Department of Justice also deals with 13 major subjects, and I need not elaborate because of the paucity time I have already mentioned. But sir, the focus which is being given today by different honorable members, particularly on the justice rendering system, the justice delivery system through the higher courts, the district courts, the subordinate courts, tribunals, etc. And we are in a, no doubt, in a state of deciding. Because things have not improved. We as a nation took a pledge to ourselves that justice should be within the reach of the common man, at the doorsteps of the common man. And so many measures have been adopted by the government, successive governments, from time to time. Even to the extent of setting up of Gram Nayalas under the Panchayats Act, so that the rural people, for each and every litigation, maybe petty litigation, they, are come to the, they have to come to the district headquarter or the subdivisional headquarter, need not be. So this way, the successive governments have tried to emphasize on the principle that I have stated, that justice at the doorsteps of the common man. But when we go and scrutinize the functioning of the judiciary as a whole, no doubt, like he has rightly pointed out, that because of the default or deficiency on the part of the executive and to some extent the legislature, I must say, admit, now we are subjected to, the people of this country are sometimes okay. subjected to even judicial excess. If I use this term judicial excess, I think it will explain everything. While on the one hand, discussing the functioning of the ministry, I must congratulate the officers and the staff who are attached to the three departments I have mentioned because they are doing commendable job. As a member of this August House since 2011, as a member of the Standing Committee related to the Ministry of Law and Justice since 2011, I have found that the officers and staff of these three departments are doing commendable job under severe constraints. But the other side is so dark, the justice rendering system, the justice delivery system, that it is going day by day out of the reach of the common man. How this is to be addressed, in spite of several measures taken by the government at different times, the things are not improving. 
Ram Gopal ji, Professor Ram Gopal ji and other honorable members have rightly pointed out about some areas. One area is every nowadays some courts, some judicial officers are more interested to dispose of or to entertain the public interest litigation. Satish ji is also here. He knows better than us. In S.P. Gupta case, probably the Supreme Court said, commented, and it is in the judgment itself, that sometimes this public interest litigation becomes publicity interested litigation or a paisa income litigation. And there are so many professionals nowadays who are moving PIL one after another for good reasons, valid reasons, or no reason. Some companies, because of their inter-company rivalry, they are putting some NGOs or even some members of our legal fraternity to move a PIL and to stall something. Even our developmental projects of the country are sometimes being stalled by some NGOs under the garb of this PIL. I think there is a judgment saying that uh, when a PIL is moved, the, the petitioner's bona fide should be... The local standard yes, should be, and there should be a deep... Uh. Uh, the petitioner should go for a deep research of the, on the subject and then come before the court. And in most of the cases, these principles are not taken care of, I am sorry to say, in spite of this judgment. Sir, now... It has gone to the extent of even some judicial officers are also very interested because their names are appearing days in and days out. Whenever or at the top of the <coughs> newspaper, you will find that today this PIL has come up, this verdict has given or some observations have been made. It has gone to the extent that whether members of parliament they will re use red beacons or not, not in their car. That is also being determined by the apex court. And the judgment is that those who are holding constitutional courts, they are only entitled. Where in the constitution, the constitutional posts have been defined and it has been stated that they will enjoy such powers or privileges, including the use of red vehicles. Lal Bhakti ka gari, MP log nahi paayenge. Ham to kabhi nahi liya zindagi mein kabhi nahi lenge. Wo dusri baat hai. Lekin jo privilege tha, isko bang kar diya gaya. Ab judges, irrespective of their position, they will enjoy. Some senior officer, bureaucrat, so this is. Now, the another point. Supreme Court is also deciding that if a member of legislature or member of parliament, if he is punished by a district court, even, or a lower court, for three years, punishment has been announced, his right to appeal goes, he, cannot, he is not entitled to be a member of legislature or parliament. Suppose a criminal defamation case has been instituted against me, and as per the IPC, it is three years, punishment is three years. And if a lower court gives a court below gives a punishment of three years against me, then I am gone from the political scenario. I am removed from the political scenario once and for all. Afterwards, if the higher court uh, exonerates you? No. As soon as as soon as the punishment is declared, I am debarred from contesting the election. That has become the judgment of the day. And we are silent. Why you are? And we are silent. The entire parliament is silent. The legislature is silent. If you are silent, why should you blame the Supreme Court for that? No, no. That is altogether a different question. That is altogether yes. a different question. Why we are silent? I am asking myself. For that, I am asking myself. For that you cannot blame that the Supreme Court. Why are we God silent? For your silence. We must. We must have. We must yes. have. Yes. If the Supreme Court has made a judgment, the parliament is supreme, why are you keeping quiet? If you are that, so is a, that is a moot question I am putting here on this occasion while discussing this working of the... He is a parliamentarian. He is a parliamentarian, that's why I am asking him. And now, sir, 
Now, sir, some members, some members, I think Abhinash ji, he is not here now. Abhinash ji has raised a very valid point, sir. Sir, sir, sir. Sir, 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 sir. sir. Now, another serious area because time is too short. You will start ringing the bell. I do not know for whom the bell tolls outside. Therefore, sir, the other serious point is, Abhinash ji rightly pointed out, there are so many innocent people even. They are lang languishing in different jails. Thousands of people, even after getting bail order from the court, they are not being released because they could not produce the surety. And so many people, they are at the mercy of the judge. It is the discretion of the judge to grant bail or not to grant bail. There is no bail act in our country. In England, there is a bail act. In our country, after 68 of year, seven years of independence, we don't have any bail act. We are at the mercy of the judicial officers. He, my lord will decide, his lordship will decide whether I am entitled to bail or not. Looking at the court records, case record, hurriedly, within minutes, and we will declare whether I will get the bail or not, even anticipatory bail. Why don't you follow? Why don't we follow a similar bail act of which is prevailing in England in, in many advanced countries? So I will ask the, I will request the Honorable uh, Minister to look into this aspect whether a bail act can be introduced by the government. Why so now, Why it not? has become a fashion of late that whatever enacted by the British Parliament 100 years back or 150 years back, all acts are, almost all acts are draconian acts. It has become a fashion. We are, the press is writing, we are also citing, particularly keeping an eye on the land bill, land act. But there are a series of acts, I need not mention all, but only two, three. Indian Evidence Act, dates back to 1872, we are still following. General Causes Act, 1897, Explosive Act, 1884, Indian Police Act, 1861, Indian Penal Code, 1860, Indian Trust Act, 1882, Indian Contract Act, 1872. Although some amendments have been given effect to from time to time, but still we are following. So, only because the acts are old or passed during, uh, by the British Parliament, it need not be uh, said that all are draconian acts. Wherever amendments are required, the government must look into it. The department concern must look into it, particularly, sir. No, sir, I, kindly give me two, three times more, because two, three minutes more, because it's a serious subject. And at my in, uh, initiation, this subject has come for discussion today in the Business Advisory Committee. I insisted for discussion on this. It's a very serious subject. Then you should have initiated it then. No, how to, because the <laughs> largest party in the opposition, they took the opportunity. I cannot help. Sir? Yeah, he's making very important points, well, very valid points. the point. CRPC and Civil Procedure Court, both CRPC and Civil Procedure Court, CPC have been amended to some extent, but it requires further amendment. Years together, cases are going on, particularly civil cases, and the learned lawyers who are practicing in the civil side, they know during my lifetime, the case may not be resolved, come to an end. And in Calcutta High Court, I have found that still there is a case, civil case of 1930 pending before Calcutta High Court. Sir, now the question, the main, main question, the vacancies and the pendency of the cases. Many honorable speakers have said, and you will speak. I need not, I just, only bullet points, highlighting the bullet points. There, are, there were recommendations from various bodies, because more than three court cases are pending nowadays in the country, and mostly in the higher courts, not in the district courts or the subordinate courts. Ratio is much higher in the higher courts. So several bodies like 
Law Commission of India, National Commission to review the working of constitution and the law ministry have proposed ways in which the issue of pendency of court may be addressed. Time frame for disposing cases. There is no time frame. I am not asking for a mandatory provision. I am not asking for that. There must be some flexibility. But there should be some rational also. That how long a case should continue? For decades together? Somewhere that there should be a full stop. So there should be a rational, yet not mandatory, for making a time frame. Sir. Similarly, creation of special courts. Government tried. Morning court, evening court. Funds were allotted. Funds are lying idle. It is not being uh, utilized properly by the states. Therefore, this area should be taken note of. Additional courts, needs of needs to assess, assessment by the high courts. High courts should itself assess dependency. Supreme Court also assess dependency themselves and how to address the problem. And sir, last point, last point is vacancy of judges. You know how many vacancies are there. Here also there were several recommendations. One recommendation was that the recruiting of judges to break even point. The recruitment of new judges should focus on the number of judges required to break even and to dispose of the backlog within three years. It was a serious recommendation yet to be adopted by the government. And I must request the Honorable Minister to look into this. Then, sir, fixing judge strength based on pendency, appointing retired judge for a year. There should be some cooling period. Ram Gopalji was telling that there is no retirement for the judges. Even after retirement, they get from the very next day, new appointment in the tribunal. So it has become the breeding ground of the judges. There may be hundreds of reasons, valid reasons, but there should be some cooling period also. Sir, now doubling of judges' strength. Yes, now conclude. And last one, Ravi Shankar ji as law minister, he introduced and we passed the legislation, both constitutional amendment and the National Judicial Appointment Commission, which is now in knee-deep water not to speak of the other bills which left due to dissolution of the Lok Sabha twice, this Judicial Accountability Bill and Judicial Inquiry Act, what about the corruption Tagiji was uh, talking about, corruption in judiciary. Lastly, sir, I say that an eminent jurist who subsequently became the speaker of the other house, he made a public statement once that nowadays justice is a purchasable commodity. And at that time, there was uproar in the country. Being a lawyer, I could not support this, but I asked my, one of my clients, a few of my clients, do you support this view? All of them said, yes. With these words, sir, I conclude, and I request the Honorable Minister look into the suggestions that I have made. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.